At Wynne Jones, we believe in innovation. Innovation refines, improves and revolutionizes. We believe in recognizing innovation and those who innovate. Innovation drives us, even if we are unaware of it. We believe that innovation should be rewarded. At Wynne Jones, we have more than 50 years experience in helping businesses achieve their goals. From, from concept to commercialization, we are right there with you. We help our clients harness their ideas and harvest their inventions, providing strategic insights into competitor activity and most importantly, protecting their assets. We know that your intellectual property is your crown jewels. Wales is a hotbed of technology and innovation. The COVID-19 pandemic has thrown medicine and healthcare into the spotlight of the global stage. Personalized medicine and predictive healthcare technology is one of the fastest growing modern industries and Wales pioneers here. Demand on healthcare resources continues to rise. However, the tools are becoming ever more advanced, leading to better results and better efficiency. Patient care is being driven forward by data-led initiatives, digital technology, advanced pharmaceuticals and medical inventions, and their role is only set to increase. We are also living the cyber revolution and Wales sits at the forefront of technology, hyperconnectivity and artificial intelligence in this cyber era. The landscape is rapidly evolving and we are proud that Wales are navigating these challenge challenges and innovating in ways never seen before by our global predecessors. Here at Wynne Jones, we are proud to be dedicated to helping you push those boundaries. We need to keep on innovating, but innovation needs to be sustainable. Sustainability protects our ecosystems, human and ecological health and natural resources. And we know that intellectual property and sustainability don't always sit neatly together. Sustainability is critical for the health of our planet, our people and our economies and innovating has never been more challenging. But it's a challenge that Wales and Wynne Jones IP are happy to meet. We are delighted again to support Wales Tech Week and this year sponsor the Smart Stage. The festival was a huge success last year and provides information and resources for those across a range of different technologies and sectors. The week showcases technology in Wales at its best and we are proud to support it. Join us this week at our events and during panel sessions. Please also drop by our virtual expo booth and feel free to get in touch. Thank you. <laughs>
um, how to address it uh, in emergent fields. Um, then we'll hand on to Dean, um, who talks a little bit more about resiliency in brownfields. So we may not be able to build it into the future because we have existing infrastructure. So what can we do today? Um, and then to change it up so we don't have just presentation after presentation, um, we're going to have a debate. We're going to have two of our um, key um, industrial cybersecurity control experts come on to sort of have a discussion about is trying to comply with standards uh, a distraction from becoming resilient or is it actually helpful? So if we comply with what are our existing standards, uh, do we think we're going to get towards resiliency? Um, of course, we're talking a lot about big systems, big companies, big infrastructure, but there's still something there for the small, medium-sized enterprise as well. So we're going to have Yulia come on, who can also help uh, provide an introduction to that area. And then finally, we'll end on a panel discussion and give everybody an opportunity to ask questions. So if you have something you wanted to bring up, um, throw it into the comments chat over to the right, um, and we'll address it either at the right time, during the debate, or at the end, during the panel discussion. So to kick off, uh, it's, resiliency is one of those topics which terms you hear a lot about. Everybody has a term for what they mean by resiliency. There's definitions in the US government has one for NIST um, about withstanding, recovering, or adapting to different conditions. The National Cybersecurity Center has some in there, uh, CNI um, um, self-assessment framework, where it's talking about the ability to recover, design so that your central functions continue to be resilient. Um, and of course, we have one of the, um, one of my favorite definitions for what resilience is from Peter Davis, who we'll hear about in a little bit more. But with all of these, it keeps coming back to the same sort of words, which is the ability to adapt, recover. And there's big explanations for, you know, sort of big terms for it, but not always it's easy to understand what does that mean in reality. So instead, I kind of like to use examples of resiliency failures. Obviously, the one on the right hand side is the one a lot of people in the CNI community point to, which is um, the hacking into the uh, Ukrainians power grid. And they started manipulating the control system and turned things off. What made uh, the Ukraine have to become resilient to is the ability to recover manually. They lost control of their uh, IT, you know, IT based systems to control the CNI. So they had to revert to manual backups, uh, sorry, and manual processes, just using radios and manually fitting switches. Another example we saw recently was the Colonial Pipelines incident in the US, where Colonial's IT systems um, got compromised and out of abundance of caution, um, but also out of um, concern that it might leak over into the production system and the ability, you know, inability to uh, bill their customers. Even if they did ship oil, they weren't wouldn't know exactly who to bill for what. So they realized that actually their business does not work if their support systems had failed. So in that regard, that sort of business continuity aspect, I'm sure their OT thought, oh, we're fine without the IT, but actually as a business resiliency, they couldn't, uh, couldn't work without access to their IT systems. Another two great examples is um, component failure. So it's not just sort of, um, you, we saw um, SolarWinds more recently with uh, an a IT appliance, the thing that manages your network, um, your network um, devices. If that becomes compromised, you potentially have, it potentially has access to compromise your entire network. Um, always, as we saw with NotPetya, that was really a compromise of uh, a piece of software, um, financial software, I believe also in the Ukraine. Um, and as a result of compromising one piece of software, it somehow uh, allowed access into those uh, big systems for major companies and caused major significant outages. So they couldn't, they were not resilient. Those companies were not resilient to a single piece of software or a piece of hardware going wrong, becoming compromised. Um, and then the last one, which I've always find interesting, is the most recent one. As a result of COVID, production facilities cut back. And so the company, Ford, and a lot of other automotive manufacturers thought it'd be really good um, to save money by basically canceling orders for chips because they said, oh, we're not going to build enough, uh, not realizing that when the production um, started up again, they suddenly went, ooh, um, I need to get access to those chips again. Can I please jump back to the front of the queue and not realizing they lost their space. And so now there's a whole load of cars sitting in parking lots uh, at the manufacturing facilities, which are missing a couple of really key um, 
chip uh, chips to go into simple, very cheap chips, but without them, the car doesn't work. So that's another example of where the supply chain didn't, you know, the, the company didn't quite um, address the risk of supply chain failures correctly. So I'm sure uh, my eminent other participants will be able to provide you with a lot more um, good thoughts and ideas around resiliency. But as a takeaway, the thing I always like to think about in terms of uh, resiliency is how do you know if it's resilient? Well, you should be allowed to let your kid play with it. Um, just if you have any concerns about should you touch it, should you not touch it? Uh, if anything goes wrong, then essentially, you know, and it's too fragile for anybody to touch, then you're probably not resilient. If you can recover from failure, if you can handle kids going on and touching stuff, you're probably in a good place. So that's me. Um, I, at this point, I'm going to um, hand over now to, um, uh, to Peter Davis, who's going to come on and tell you all about resiliency in greenfield systems. So Peter, over to you. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, hopefully you can see my presentation. So I'll talk to you about resilience in greenfields um, and give you some thoughts from the automotive sector here. Um, this is my resilience thing. It's been there since my child was at school and he, he's, he's now got children of his own. So um, this is who I am. I, I, I specialize in looking at, at security where it matters, supply chain infiltration, cyber physical attacks. I lead, I lead um, um, or have led cybersecurity aspects for various CAV things. And I've been doing this for a, for a lot of years um, in relation to this, having started doing pacemakers. Um, and here are some questions for you. you know, so how do I get a methodology that's cyber resilient, both technical and both technologically and economically feasible? Um, and that is one of the things that's often forgotten. We keep talking about how we need to do these things, but that technological and economical feasibility is a really big element in relation to that. Um, how do the types of security mechanisms that you choose contribute to the thread of evidence? Because uh, actually you need to know what you're doing around these things. And contradictory objectives is one of my really big things. Just consider um, if you're trying to do GDPR related things, you're trying to do safety related things, they're in the same system in relation to that. Often what you've got is something for which the failure modes, the way that what you have to make it resilient against are not the same. Um, and then how do mismatches between expected evidence and that produced between parties form a major system, part of system failure? So partly what Alex was talking about there, this idea that actually you've got supply chains or, or supply ecosystems in relation to those sorts of things. Um, and those are really major elements. This is my um, slide that I've been using for some time, actually looking at what, what is the problem that we have in here. And fundamentally, the problem that we have is there is no such thing as a greenfield site. It all relies on other things anyway. And what we're looking at increasingly is systems that are deploying on top of other systems. You, you're deploying a software capability on top of a cloud or you're, or you're using various bits that have been in place. Um, and this was one of the things that we looked at. Well, one of the reasons why we picked up on connected autonomous cars because of this, this thing that they are part of a complex. And that's the term I'll come back to, hyper-connected and bottom-up system with emergent properties. And that's a really important thing to think about, emergent properties. 90% of the value of the economy is based on emergent properties. And very often, as, you know, what we're doing is trying to design systems to lock them down so that we actually can't take advantage of these. That is a really big challenge to your economic viability if you're looking at that kind of stuff. So to put that into context, the typical systems that I look at have got elements of safety and privacy and business value, all of which are regulated in some ways, all of which are actually the responsibility of, of C-level um, executives in the board, yeah, the sorts of things that you need to do, and all of which have contradictory requirements in relation to that. The evidence that comes out of these things don't look the same, and what resilience is doesn't look the same. So just as an indication, whilst it may be applicable in the case of a privacy, to decide that from a resilient point of view, I want to shut that thing down, recover what it is and build it up again. That is not a very appropriate activity in relation to planes uh, where shutting it down in midair is not a good thing to do. Resilience means a completely different thing in relation to that. And resilience in relation to small scale systems and relation to these hyper-connected systems is again, a completely different thing that you're looking at. 
if you consider the difficulties that are associated with many of the cloud-based systems that you're looking at, part of the difficulty is simply, how do I start it up again in the event that it ever were to shut down? Um, and that is a really big thing that I think that we need to consider as part of these. Um, as Alex says, and um, I'm very <laughs> grateful for him using the, the phrase there, the system is resilient if and only if there's justifiable and enduring confidence that it will function as expected when expected. That, to me, was a really important starting position in relation to that. It gives you this idea that you need to be able to get this thing doing what you want it to do throughout its life. And the point about that is that isn't always the same thing. And you have a justifiable reason or you need to have a justifiable reason for believing that it will have to be able to do that. So when I bought a PC 15 years ago, I did not expect it to do exactly the same things that I expect it to do today. Uh, the, the onus on cloud, the onus on, on connectivity, the onus on all of these different things is different as we go along in relation to that. And I put in the middle of this some of the things that I think need to be considered. So very often um, we're asked to do things like hardening things if we want them to be resilient. Um, and over on the right, you'll see the concrete building that are shattered in an earthquake, which is, it, which is part of the problem if we make things um, if we make things you know, tough in that kind of way and strong, we will also make them brittle, which is not good. So the considerations of resilience often fly in the face of some of these hardening things. The other elements on the other side there, the, the, um, the gate, um, which is in my local forest around here, is, is, a, is a gate that has, has no fence around it for, 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 you know, for those of you that are observant. And the point about that is very often what we do is small scale components that we, that we argue are working well. We use cryptography, we use things that is nature. So that, that's great, and we will improve those parts. But if they're not connected into the entire system, then from a cyber attack point of view, from a complexity point of view, that is a real, that is a real issue. Um, and certainly it makes a difference to me being able to provide the kind of evidence that would be applicable to justifiable enduring confidence. And in the middle there is, the, is an attack, it's a real-time attack, for which I have to thank my colleagues at Imperial College, uh, a poisoning attack against a machine, a machine learning algorithm in a sensor. Uh, so essentially destroying that in real time. So the, these are the things that you need to be looking at. The next thing is that actually we have to be able to do evidential quality cyber security. That's one of the reasons we do greenfield things here, because we've got to be able to do something that we can produce the right evidence for. And that is something that is often forgotten. So waving of my hands and saying, I think it's a bit better, tends not to be something that's very useful if you actually have to put that to court. And if you think in terms of what would a safety case mean, as opposed to what would a privacy case mean, then actually what does evidence mean is a really important element around that. So I'd like to talk a little bit here about complexity, recalls and affordability. So these are stats coming out of the automotive industry. And what you'll see here going through in the UK, in the US, um, and the same is true in all nations uh, worldwide, what you're seeing is, a, is essentially a, a, the beginning of an exponential growth in recalls that are associated with complexity, um, which is very important because everybody still thinks these things are small um, and relatively, relatively small in relation to that. If you actually put that then with the type of things that you're looking at in terms of of the number of cyber attacks, the number of things that you would have to respond to over, the, over an eight year lifetime, it's in the order of a quarter of a million. And the reason for saying these sorts of things is, so when you're looking at resilience and you're looking at your ability to have a management process in place to cope, cope with these sorts of things, then not only are you looking at things for which emergence and emergent properties are turn out to be really important, but you're looking at something that is operating at a scale that is way beyond what most people are actually putting things into, and indeed beyond what most people would find to be economically feasible. And this is based really around the idea that we're still doing static, fix it afterwards, fix it afterwards, fix it afterwards. That is not a solution to resilience. And that is one of our observations. When you come to doing security analysis and security engineers, you know, people will still encourage you to do the things in the way that we would have done them when we had small scale systems. But actually that's not what we have anymore. What we have is large scale systems and we need to move away from these sorts of things that are actually fundamentally static because they are costing us money and they are not actually getting to where we need to in terms of getting the outcomes. And that concentration on outcome based 
is I think one of the really important things that you need to take away if you're trying to do resilience into a greenfield system. This is just a quick drop through what has happened. So this is the way that people still think about braking systems on cars. They think about it as an ACLD system, which is a, a system that's got the highest classification, ISO 26262. He says it's, it's a safety critical system, but if you actually look on what it actually is, yeah, what you have is a system that's got six types of cyber attacks that can't be taken away, that can be broken, which yeah, has fundamental questions about ownership of data inside these kinds of systems. It is a digital and complicated system. And that observation of 10 to 23 sensors, one and a half to two and three and a half million lines of code, training data sets from, you know, from machine learning algorithms, this is a complex system in its own right and beyond what we would normally be able to, uh, to analyze. And yet, anyone would say we expect that to be resilient. So the thing that really starts to come under this is, is either we don't want to be doing that kind of stuff or we need a new way and a new vocabulary for talking about these sorts of things. And that becomes even more complex if you start looking at connected cars and you start looking at the connection of things that are above the gan on the gantries above the above the um, uh, the motorways, things coming from satellite, your positioning in relation to that, the reliance on other vehicles when you actually talk about resilience. It's that system that you care about as opposed to the individual component inside there. And indeed, it may be, as we saw with the with the um, with the building, that the individual component will be breaking the resilience of the system because it's not actually well suited and, and not fitting into it. We came up with a methodology that fundamentally said, yeah, you need to move in, into the operational space if you want uh, resilience in relation to these things, and you need to operate according to three principles and six arguments that you're going to be needing to do, and those are principles such as being able to calculate the amount of um, you know, the time it will take you both to detect, to understand, and then to be able to act on things. That is a really important thing in relation to resilience. But also, how much diversity you've got in these things. Very often, we make everything the same. You know, many of the things that Alex talked about before, one of the problems was they were all the same. So once something broke through, the, yeah, the consequences were catastrophic. And that's one of the things you really have to avoid in terms of resilience. And the third principle that you need to be looking at in relation to that is how many proactive updates must you have around? So how many differences must you have ready to go, either partially deployed or actually in a position where you can go to those in order to maintain your resilience position? Or to put that another way, how will I be able to operate with 66% of my network working and be able to sacrifice the other 33. And that has to form part of your greenfield decision about what you're trying to do. So what has Talos been looking at in relation to some of these things? We've been looking at the use of distributed ledgers to actually put really complex things together, to look at how would you use calculations of things like stability and diversity um, in systems as part of your fundamental things of being able to calculate whether a system was actually was actually resilient or not. So, and the observation that over time, over an eight year period, you often become less stable as, pro as, as properties emerge um, is a really important thing in your design of systems. So designing it around these kinds of twins, these kinds of tools um, is a fundamental element. Using your AI you know, so that it actually works against an attacker and not for an attacker is again a really important thing of trying to calculate what you need to do in terms of a diverse system going forward. So to try and put this in terms of some answers and some, some things that I might that I think might come out of that, you know, one of them is recognizing that security mechanisms are not an end in themselves. Uh, and the same is true of almost everything else that we have in terms of IT. These are tools that you use in order to contribute to your goals. And the goals, for instance, of a car are, are are that it should perform, perform a transport system, that it should be safe. Yet yeah, that those are the things that you're looking at, that it should be green. They are not that it should be secure, but they are mechanisms that you need to use in order to do that. So, so for my colleagues in the security end, industry, that is a really important thing. Start talking about the things that matter as end goals and recognize that they change over time and what that might mean. This element of contradictions in purpose are a fundamental feature of modern mobility systems. And indeed, I would argue of almost every system that I now look at. 
Um, and recognizing that is a really important thing in pursuing, um, yeah, in not pursuing the impossible when allowing economically well-founded security in relation to these things. So understanding that there will be always be contradictions and indeed the decision that one part of the ecosystem may correctly make will affect what I'm trying to do in relation to this. Nobody has ever done the wrong thing. You will still get a bad outcome. And that's why we talk about those stability things there. And recognizing, declaring through the supply and ecosystem what is being made strong and what is made brief, brittle, rather than pretending that security is ad additive, is again a really fundamental thing of being able to put in place a plan that you need to be able to make these systems resilient over long term. And the last thing I think I'd like you to argue is that techniques such as pattern of life, significant difference, CMOS variability, approximate, they all have the potential to deliver forensically interesting, forensically useful things. Those are things that we don't often talk about when we're talking about security and resilience of our systems, but we should. They are much more important in many ways than things like cryptographic algorithms, routes of trust, and things of this nature. These are the elements that actually are forming and dynamically in a system, and they will become increasingly important as the types of systems that you concentrate on for your resilience become cyber physical rather than purely digital systems. And I think that was the end and of my presentation. Thank you very much for taking the trouble to listen to me. And I'll hand on to the next one. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, so yeah, next up we have Dean Yandel, who's going to give us a bit uh, more of an appreciation for what's it like um, designing resiliency into Brownfield. But as Peter says, it's all Brownfield, whether or not you think it's Greenfield or not. So Dean, it's really all down to you. Thanks, Alex. Uh, can we share the screen? Can you see my screen here? That's great. Uh, so, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to my presentation on cyber resiliency in Brownfield, or how we would incorporate resiliency into uh, existing OT systems. My name is Dean Yandel. I'm an uh, industrial controls engineer based here at uh, Talis NDEC in the sunny South Wales Valleys in Ebervale. Uh, my background is in uh, industrial control systems uh, engineering. Uh, within manufacturing facilities. I've also had the pleasure of working on many projects uh, in different industry sectors throughout the years. So resilience by definition, as we touched on a, a little earlier, there's there's many definitions uh, of resilience. Uh, so let's look at the, at the in-depth cyber definition. Uh, the ability of systems to resist, absorb, and recover from or adapt to an adverse occurrence during operation that may cause harm, destruction, or loss of ability to performance, performance mission-related functions. Uh, well, of course, we can, we can argue that's true. Uh, let's look at maybe a little simpler definition. Cyber resilience is an uh, entity's ability to continuously deliver an intended outcome despite adverse cyber events. Uh, in my mind, I can break that down a, a little bit further in that uh, if we uh, have a, a cyber event occurrence, then simply the system will keep calm and carry on. Uh, so in my mind, I break it down into uh, resilience is the ability to be able to run a system. So the need for resiliency in a brownfield environment, so in a industry setting or industrial setting uh, whereby uh, maybe uh, resiliency is required, uh, older industrial sites do not have the luxury of new build sites or processes. So brownfield industries, uh, older industry settings and sites, although have requirement uh, to compete in an open marketplace with their newer, maybe more technically advanced competitors, they often don't have the infrastructure required in place to make upgrades without having to firstly carefully consider uh, the cyber risks. So the upgrades to operation technology, uh, while they have to maintain cyber resiliency has to be made, and they have to be made without impacting uh, on the production or the manufacturing process. And that's really the challenge here, in that uh, the sites need to, be, need to be upgraded. We need to build in resiliency. Uh, we need to make these changes, make these additions to the processes and the systems without impacting on the existing production processes. 
New sites, of course, uh, where we've had time to consider this in the actual uh, build of the site or in the build of the new industrial setting, uh, have the luxury of being able to, to consider this up front. And they don't have the uh, added pressure of, of that uh, production facility having to keep running. So the need to better understand the manufacturing process. Uh, many many industries uh, will will want to uh, upgrade, uh, install their uh, existing uh, automation systems, uh, and upgrading them really is is maybe down to collection of data. So data obviously is is king, and uh, information collected from this data would allow for improvements to be easily identified and processes to be further automated. So it's really putting a magnifying glass on that area uh, of, of the industry or the manufacturing facility uh, in order to, to, to make improvements. So there's an increased requirement uh, for machine to machine connectivity and the use of technologies in order to uh, to actually get the company to uh, obtain further and more data on the manufacturing process. How many widgets per hour are we making? Which part of the production line is, is more, more effective? Uh, so these things actually drive the requirement uh, for the new technologies. And of course, resiliency has to be built into this. And while we're installing these new technologies, making these new machine-to-machine -machine connections, collecting this new data, uh, especially the, the, the older industries, uh, the experts within the industry may not be there. So there's an increased use of specialist service and maintenance contractors uh, being used. And, and again, we see this uh, as a risk and uh, needs to be mitigated in need for, uh, for resiliency of the site. And of course, the, the real the real driver for this, we'll see uh, remote working uh, has been a, uh, a a requirement actually, uh, as we've all seen in uh, the recent months, and you know the increase in the remote working environment uh, has has led to to new risks. Uh, while bringing many operational benefits, of course, uh, we also improve the cyber or increase the cyber risk of the business. So streamlining of industrial maintenance, uh, again, another area where uh, we need to, to consider uh, where we're upgrading and some of the older sites, uh, these are drivers really for, for, for upgrades, uh, is the streamlining of existing industrial maintenance. Uh, maintenance packages, maintenance systems uh, are becoming uh, much more automated. Uh, so maintenance management systems, now connecting to the actual machinery directly and we may be predicting uh, when maintenance is due on equipment uh, and this prediction can be made either through real-time measurements uh, or it can be made from uh, mean time to failure uh, uh, estimates on on equipment but but having the whole factory interconnected uh, of course is is the way everybody's uh, uh, sort of trying to update their systems Here's the real driver be behind it all. Uh, so we're looking at 99% of attacks on industrial control systems uh, already exploit known vulnerabilities and weaknesses. And in, in a brownfield site, of course, uh, these vulnerability and weaknesses, as we'll see in a moment, can be can be many. So some of the blockers uh, or challenges, maybe. Maybe I should have named this one uh, residency challenges in uh, brownfield sites. So while some companies have carefully considered the cyber risks, many, uh, many don't. And some of the technology upgrades required uh, that we see on site have creeped into the business through necessity. So as as maybe machinery is broken down, as maybe older older equipment, uh, which is which is not microprocessor, not a PLC, maybe has been replaced uh, with newer equipment, then this can creep into the business over time. Uh, so we may have very uh, technologically advanced equipment in there, uh, which has been replaced in older equipment. The real issue here is the availability of uptime uh, on an existing brownfield site. So, so where we have already manufacturing and uh, production uh, going through uh, an industry, uh, this is something we simply won't won't stop. Uh, so we have to continue uh, with the production process uh, while also ensuring that we we build in resiliency into the new devices uh, that are being fitted. Uh, 
routine patching and updating of firmware on a on a brownfield site uh not so not so not so often seen and in fact uh, it's something we see we see very seldom common place to see industrial process control equipment so we're talking about legacy equipment here uh hmis plcs again now lasting well in excess of 20 years and 20 years ago this this cyber resiliency the the effect of of the cyber uh, wasn't actually considered so a lot of this uh legacy equipment uh Again, you know, we need to be we need to be looking at, but it's inevitable that the connectivity on this legacy equipment will will be required. Recently, talking to to an old colleague who's been working on uh, a couple of hammer PLC actually that that was 32 years old uh, and actually had it, the battery had failed, uh, but the actual hardware was was still running well. So network management and connectivity has historically been seen as the domain of IT departments within the industrial setting. And, and again, this is something, uh, a mindset change uh, probably for, for the industry uh, in that the, uh, the operation technology and the ownership of everything that goes with operation technology, including the managed network, uh, needs to be in the domain of the, uh, of the OT engineer. And the focus on continuity of production often leads to upgrading and OT being made uh, without consideration of ramifications. This is where we're upgrading equipment. Uh, and often the upgrades you know, can be seen as, as temporary, but of course we know temporary normally remains, it's gonna remain in place for many years to come. So really resiliency in the brownfield, how, how do we build this in? So, so let's look, we, we can prepare. So on, on a, a site which has a little a background or little knowledge on cybersecurity within an industrial setting. Assess the risk. You know, let's let's look see where our critical processes are. See where our uh, critical equipment is, uh, and then identify this uh, critical infrastructure, and we can locate the weaknesses. We need to bridge this disconnect between the IT and automation uh, departments. Uh, so operational technology OT specialists uh, may be required to, to advise you, but bridging that gap between IT and OT is certainly something that uh, is, is a mindset change within the industry. Uh, training, all these things go to make up resiliency, uh, you know, training of operators, training of staff, uh, awareness, uh, again, something that, that should be considered by companies that are just sort of maybe starting out on this journey. Uh, update and patching, the ability to do so, I, I appreciate isn't isn't always that easy in uh, an industrial setting because uh, nobody wants to put a, a machine down to update or patch. Uh, clear procedures, best practice, of course, and know the network and the devices. Uh, introduce the segmentation and network structure for OT. So it's, it's really making a start on that. Assess the risk, identify critical national uh, critical infrastructure and locate weaknesses, and bridge the disconnect between IT and the OT, of course. And of course, this this diagram shows uh, how the seg network segmentation uh, could could be done in a location. So anticipate, we remain in a state of readiness. Uh, so we risk assessed earlier. So if we're gonna continue on the journey, we need to dynamically risk assess and continue that risk assessment. Uh, adapt, be able to uh, remain able and willing to be able to uh, modify all the business areas uh, in changes to, 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 to technical or threat environments. Uh, recover. This is where we're looking, yeah, if, if, if a cyber attack is successful, uh, then how do we recover? Let's consider uh, how, how we do this before it happens. Uh, you know, maybe uh, ensure the, the backups work, maybe we sure we have uh, equipment on standby, uh, playbook procedures uh, almost uh, to ensure the continuation of services. So resiliency in practice, uh, just just these are some things, not everything that makes up resiliency, but just some things. So as we said in training, uh, maybe maybe asset discovery, one of the tools in our toolbox uh, in that you know, we, we need to understand what devices we have on site already, how our network structure is made. Uh, and and should we have uh, any, any additional uh, network devices come online, uh, then we can immediately detect and pick them these up. 
secure remote connections. Uh, many existing industrial uh, locations uh, already have secure remote connections. They may not know about them all, uh, or they have remote connections, which they may not know about. Uh, and again, some of the contractors and the uh, external support companies uh, may have dial-in methods uh, just to come directly into the operational technology uh, side of their network. And that may be perfectly legitimate, uh, but, but let's just question whether or not the uh, external contractor actually has secure uh, uh, procedures in on 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 the side. If we use this with the anticipate, uh, the adapt, and the the recover philosophy, then uh, we're there. We're going to need to wrap up, I'm afraid. Perfect. That's okay. I'll take you to that one then. And oh, uh, right. that's that's me, Dan. <laughs> that's great. Thanks so much, Dean. Appreciate it. No worries. Um, Thank you. Just I want to make sure we have enough time to get everybody in, including now we're going to bring up on stage. Um, John Elder um, and Josie Houghton, who are going to do a really good debate on um, whether or not um, the drive to comply with standards such as IEC 62443 or NIST Subsecurity Framework distracts us or helps us potentially uh, become more resilient. So what the format of this is going to be, Josie um, is going to have four or five minutes to do an introduction, say her bit, followed by John. Then we're going to allow each of them to respond to each other for two or three minutes and then open up to questions from the floor. Um, so if you have any questions about this debate, want to hear a response, please uh, feel free to throw them in the comment section. All right, Josie, over to you. All right, morning everyone. Um, so I'm Josie and I'm an OT cybersecurity consultant. I'm also an expert in IEC 62443 and a member of the ISA 99 committee. And what, what I find is that a lot of people fundamentally misunderstand 62443. So they see that it's a massive standard and they see the checkboxes in the back of 3.3. And they think that if they can tick all of the checkboxes, that they're compliant. But that's only one small part of the standard series. And when you consider the series as a whole, the standard isn't about compliance at all. It's about understanding and appropriately and proportionately responding to risk. So when you look at 2.1, that it, it encourages the asset owner to set up a governance system for its OT. And this could either be a dedicated uh, CSMS or it could be an extension to existing IT processes within the ISMS. And when you do that, it talks about making sure you know what you've got. So you've got your asset registers. It talks about risk assessment. So using the guidance in 3.3 to risk assess. And what those risk assessments do is they allow you to prioritize where to spend your security budget. So a mistake I often see is uh, asset owners or consultants saying everything must be SL3. And that's, that's the wrong way of looking at the standard because when you look at the interlinking between 3.2 and 3.3, what's actually supposed to happen is in 3.3, in 3.2, you look at the zones and conduits, you break your system down into security zones, and then you use those zones to do your risk assessment. And you may find that some zones have a much lower security target. And what that means is that it allows you to prioritize where you're spending your security budget. Yes, you know, your, your safety system might have a really high security level, but standard control might have a really low security level. So you can proportionately respond. So then that means that compliance with 3.3 is really just the cherry on top. And then the other part of uh, 62443 that kind of encourages this uh, secure by design is 4-1. And that is aimed at components, but you can use it when you're designing your entire system. If you follow a secure by design lifecycle, then throughout the design of your products, you're going to you're going to introduce those checks and governances and balances to ensure that by the time you reach the end of your design process, you have a product that's that's had security baked in from the start. 
and all of this proper governance, um, having everything written down and everything uh, well understood by the asset owner, that enables them to do good incident response. If you're just ticking boxes in 3.3, then you're not prepared to respond to incidents. You've just applied a load of technology. But if you really want to be resilient, then you need to look at the whole standard as a whole, and it supports you in doing that. John. Thanks, Josie. Um, yeah, this is, I'm John Elder. I'm just going to check you can see me. Yeah, webcam's up. Uh, I'm John Elder. I'm an ICS security consultant at Talis. I work on the same team as Josie as well. Um, and this debate regarding the topic of does the drive to comply with 62443 to distract from resiliency um, certainly sparked a lot of discussion in the office. And I think on some points, Josie and I agree and others we, we disagree. Um, for me, I, I take the topic of resiliency in these systems back down to the, the very sort of basic engineering levels. Um, I think security when it comes to ICS components and OT components or in these environments has almost become a bit of a distraction in that we've forgotten this really good basic engineering practices. And I think a lot of the solutions in, in the OT space or the IC security space particularly, um, almost almost have been created for problems that don't exist but they want the problems to exist to sell the product for the solution which i think can still be mitigated by really good engineering um principles and, and, and engineering design so absolutely 62443 or, or NIST csf has those principles in them that, are, that can be followed but i think going back to the the topic of, of peter and dean earlier greenfield and brownfield um make whether you can apply those principles um, difficult or, or easy. So I think in terms of how 6443 would distract from becoming resilient, it's almost, as Josie said earlier, and I'll probably take the other side of the argument, is a lot of security can be compliance focused or driven. So people want to comply with something, they want to tick the boxes to say they comply with something, and, and then when they see that they mostly comply or, or their gap analysis is mostly green, then they have perhaps a false sense of security. And I think on that topic as well, people tend to mix up the term security and resiliency. I think you can be secure, but not be resilient. So a simple example, if let's say your network is truly completely isolated and it can't be brought down by an external cyber attack, that's fine. But then if you're not running systems with redundancy or high availability and one falls down due to component failure, um, then I wouldn't say you're resilient. So I think as well, you need to be careful that when you're applying 6443 or any um, of these standards and guidelines, is that you don't introduce conflicts that would hamper resiliency. So some of the recommended practices in NIST, for example, would be have um, diversification of assets. So let's say have a firewalls from two different vendors. So um, if one gets compromised by a zero day, the other one would there's less chance that it would be affected by the same fault um, or perhaps introduce network segmentation. And these are absolutely good practices, but you also need to consider how that will affect your resiliency. So if you have diverse assets um, or you have network segmentation, taking the examples I had earlier, then you need to make sure that the tools you have to monitor those assets um, can support monitoring a wider range of assets or if you've got really segmented networks, then contextual awareness of your environment is going to be more difficult because you've got more segments to monitor. And therefore, those security controls, as positive, uh, positive as they are, um, might actually limit your resiliency or your ability to respond to events that would ultimately um, cause disruption you don't want as well. So for me, I think it's more an argument of fund fundamentally addressing engineering issues and looking at what the system's been designed to perform and what you want it to perform and what would stop it performing that way. Um, and then having that conversation with the view to the security as another object that might stop the system performing the way you want it to. Thanks, John. So Josie, anything to respond to on John's side? Um, yeah, so I, I think fundamentally what standards provide is 
guidance and for uh, asset owners that are less familiar with security procedures without standards, how do you think um, they would uh, be guided to use the right uh, security practices? So I think the, the important thing to think of with standards is they are they are guidance and they're not ready to use out the box to, to, to just apply straight to your organization as well. So I think it's always a case of take the good practice, but really um, if you don't have the skill set or the knowledge internally, then find a partner you could trust, you could help you bridge that link between what it is you're worried about, your, your feared events or your risk events, whether you're taking a bottom up approach, looking at the assets you're most concerned about or the top down approach and looking at the events you don't want to happen. Um, and then using that guidance to support or tailoring it rather is a better phrase, I think, um, to support achieving your, your own objectives that way. Interesting. And John, do you have any questions back for Josie? Yeah, so I think in, I would say in response is, would you say that following 6243 would guarantee resiliency if you hit all the boxes within 6243? It doesn't guarantee resiliency, but I think if you are using those secure by design principles, then it does set you off in the right path. And, you know, especially if you are doing, you know, 3-2 compliant risk assessments. So CCE um, fills uh, the 3-2 compliance tick box if you want to do things that way. And I think CCE is an excellent way of risk assessing systems. So, yeah, it, it points you in the right direction, but it is ultimately down to the practitioner that uses it. And for those people who are not familiar with uh, consequence-based uh, or consequence-informed um, cyber engineering, the CCE, Josie, do you want to give a quick explanation to what that is? Um, yeah, so uh, CCE is a risk assessment methodology um, that kind of uses fault trees to map out how different attacks would potentially affect the system. And then once you know those effects, then you can start introducing engineering controls uh, in order to kind of uh, either reduce the likelihood or reduce the consequence. Thanks. Yeah, put together by Idaho National Lab. So if you just type into Google the letters C, C, E, and I, N, L, you should be able to come across it. Um, so that was a really interesting discussion between you guys. Um, and so I do want to sort of press one uh, point John had, um, which is you asked about whether um, compliance with a standard would get you towards being it. But you know, to answer John's question directly, can you be secure but not resilient? in your opinion, Josie? No, I don't think you can. I, I, I think resiliency is an important part of security. And I think that no so amount of- So is it a Venn tech... diagram or is it a subset? So can you be yeah. resilient but not secure? Or can be secure but not resilient? Or can is it a subset? Um, yeah, I think it's a it's a Venn diagram. So there's crossover in the middle. Um, but I think, you know, the ideal place that you need to be is in the middle. Um, and yeah, I, I think cybersecurity, it brings in technical controls. But in OT, technical controls do not necessarily protect you from physical consequences. And, you know, if we compare this to safety, we don't immediately start putting in safety PLCs. We start by doing hardwired safety design because hardwired safety design is better. Um, and, you know, the, the safety PLCs come in when we need complicated uh, algorithms or when we need complex control. Um, so I, I think if you start with uh, having that thought and that thought process about resiliency, then it's going to push you more towards a, a holistic form of security. So, John, would you kind of agree with that? The idea is that you get more complex systems. The idea of adding in yet more complexity to solve it may not be the right answer. Maybe sometimes you want to add more simplicity in it in order to achieve resiliency. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a, a massive fan of keeping things simple. Um, and I think the more complexity you add in, the, the more opportunity there is to miss something that may undermine your resiliency or from a security perspective, I think the the more you add in, the more you broaden your, your attack surface as well. So I think um, given the opportunity, I would always choose to simplify it um, wherever possible. I did have one more question for you, John, and that's 
you talked, and I, I kind of agree with you, the idea of if you're um, following a standard and it's a cultural thing of just looks tick box compliance based approach, you're going to miss the subtleties of what it's trying to drive at. Um, and I agree in a, from a security standpoint, and the standards today are very much focused on security. If we move to try and force down resiliency and we try and create some sort of standard around resiliency, won't the same cultural issues just impact now resiliency? I mean, it sounded like you were saying there's a cultural issue with security, but I don't understand, will that not also impact resiliency? I think so. And I think um, there's a risk of if the standard suddenly flipped and focused on resiliency, that the same thing would happen. Um, I think it's just the conversation may be happening at a, a different level in the organization as well. So a lot of the times in the organizations we're dealing with, um, they're, they're brownfield in nature, the systems already exist, and the reality is they're, they're stuck with the systems the way they are. So um, I think the conversation needs to be happening, um, or rather engagement with organization needs to be happening at a wider range of levels um, to truly get to perhaps the root concern of the organization and ultimately is trying to prevent that thing from happening. So whether that's a case of we only have this old component and we don't have any spares for it, or um, we're really worried about the next ransomware attack bringing it down. Interesting. Um, and then to both of you, it's been, one of the common debates at the moment is around patching. And you both brought it up. Um, part of me says, you know, introducing, you know, almost forcing uh, companies, uh, asset owners, to patch on a regular basis would increase resiliency because they would have to start designing account to the fact that patches and updates are going to screw things up. So by just forcing the issue, they're going to have to get more comfortable with design. Um, but then the other ha uh, side of me goes, yeah, but is patching always the right sort of uh, approach to maybe solving the security issue? Um, shouldn't you be thinking about trying to minimize the impacts of things rather than relying on patches going forward? So Josie, I'll start with you. Do you have an opinion or should we be patching more, keeping the same level? And what's the impact of that towards security and resiliency? Yeah, well, I think at the moment, um, the technology within OT is not designed to be patched. You know, we've got a lot of legacy stuff. And even now, the the software houses, uh, you know, the large OEMs, they're not set up to do that patch management part on their end. And so for an asset owner trying to do patch management, it's very difficult. And there are a lot of challenges and, you know, it, it's things like every time uh, your antivirus updates, it has a potential to break bits of your SCADA, which is not acceptable. So, I mean, what, what 62443 recommends is that you have a process for patch management, but it doesn't recommend that you do patch manage everything because it is so difficult and so challenging within OT environments. I would, I would take a different view in that patch management is just a very small part um, of the overall picture. I think I'm never going to go into an organization and say you need to patch everything. The organizations we assess, um, there's a, a lot you could disrupt them if from a cyber attack point of view, if you wanted to bring them down, you could do it well before you, let's say, um, reach some unpatched PLC that has a trivial cross-site scripting vulnerability in it. I think you need to look at the, um, go back to what Josie said about CC, CCE as a whole, if you're taking that approach or look at the events or the kill change you're worried about and then what elements in that um, kill. Uh, I think we have resiliency from with John. Josie, you seem to be winning on this one. <laughs> We've got to take it into context with um, the bigger picture. Perfect. Thanks, John. Um, Josie, any final pa uh, parting words, thoughts on what's been said? Um, yeah, I, I, and yeah, I, I think the whole standards compliance issue, it, it's, as I say, it's about considering the standards as a whole. And, you know, I've talked a lot about 62443 because that's my point of expertise. But I mean, NIST, it has the same elements in it. You know, that's also encouraging you to do risk assessment and to proportionately respond uh, to the risk that you're identifying. Um, so, yeah, I, I think in general, it's um, the standards can support you 
if you read them. And John, any final words? Yeah, there's a lot of great guidance out there um, in the standards. I'll definitely ag agree with Josie on that. And for some uh, organisations that might not know where to start, um, I, th I think they provide really good material as well. But again, my philosophy is always to keep things as simple as possible. Um, there's a lot of um, FUD out on the market, I would say, fear, uncertainty and doubt. Um, and I think fundamentally we're dealing with engineering systems and I think it's important not to lose sight of good engineering practices and principles that we would want to apply to these systems to stop um, unwanted events happening to them so just keep that in mind and and try not to let security um, be too much of a distraction uh, at the end of the day. Brilliant well thank you very much Josie and John uh, that was really interesting. Um, so next up, and we'll bring them everybody back on for panel discussion in a minute. But be, right before that, we're going to hand over to Julia, who's going to Julia, who's going to come on and talk to us a little bit more about uh, this, um, small and medium-sized enterprises. At the moment, we've been talking a lot about big systems, critical national infrastructure. So over to you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Um, very interesting discussion. So taking you to a slightly different domain and talking about SMEs small and medium-sized enterprises. So I'm talking about the project. Uh, it was recently completed. It's a collaborative project between business school and School of Computer Science and Informatics at Cardiff Uni. And the project was funded by the National Cybersecurity Center and the Risks Research Institute on Social Technical Security. So I will be talking about background and research methodology just for a couple of minutes, but the main part of the presentation is to talk about best practice recommendations for SMEs. There are 6 million SMEs in the UK, quite a large audience. As you can imagine, they constitute 99% of all businesses. SMEs are considered as a softer target, as you can imagine again, by cyber criminals and an easy backdoor into larger businesses. And we can see um, lots of kind of evidence for that from the recent supply chain attacks. SMEs are typically less aware uh, about cybersecurity. They pay less attention to cybersecurity. But here I have to uh, kind of clarify that through our research, we've seen that there are significant differences between SMEs because some may be really well prepared. Some may be completely unaware about cybersecurity. So there are differences there uh, for sure. But many SMEs, they really see cybersecurity as an unavoidable burden as an insurance at the best, but not as anything uh, so, sort of strategically important. Uh, just to refer to some recent statistics, um, in 2020, 46% of organizations report having a cybersecurity breach in the last 12 months. For uh, SMEs, the cost of a breach varies between three and five thousand pounds. Eight in 10 SMEs say that, uh, not SMEs, but businesses in general say that cybersecurity is high priority for them. But at the same time, only 37% in 2020 had a person responsible for cybersecurity on their board or generally within an organization. So for clarification at the bottom here, I have a note saying that for SMEs, we were considering companies um, with uh, less than 250 employees. We didn't look at any other criteria. We only uh, classified companies based on the number of employees. In terms of our research methodology, we conducted review of non-academic uh, literature on security economics. Um, we interviewed then 15 representatives of UK SMEs. We analyzed the collected data and distilled common issues and formulated best practice recommendations. And then they run a focus group, again, with SME representatives to validate our recommendations. In terms of the participants of the study, so as I mentioned, 15 representatives. It was a good balance of technical experts and senior executives. So we really tried to make it a balanced set of recommendations. So it's not kind of directed at technical experts uh, only. Uh, for the final kind of deliverable of the project, it's a best practice guide for SMEs on cybersecurity investment decision making. The guide is available both in English and in Welsh, and it could be downloaded from the website and it's obviously free available to all SMEs. So we try to put that uh, 
generic guidance to SMEs on how they can improve their security posture. It should not be seen as a set of sort of easy to follow steps for SMEs because we often get a comment, oh, it's hard to implement. By no means we are suggesting that those steps are very easy to implement because some may require um, a, a real change in uh, business culture for SMEs. So going through the recommendations, recommendation number one, cybersecurity is a business enabler and a competitive advantage. As I've mentioned at the beginning, that's not how SMEs see cybersecurity. As I said, for them, it's mostly a burden and unavoidable cost. So we're suggesting that based on the um, uh, data of the interviews, that changing that culture at the business, at the senior executive level may lead, uh, may lead to a real change within an SME. And I know that cybersecurity researchers uh, would say that kind of that's been around for a long time. And I absolutely agree with that. So that's been all around the place for the last probably 20 years. And when I did my uh, initial uh, PhD project and further research, it was around. But that's not something that SMEs really took on board. And that, that message certainly needs to be reiterated. Second recommendation for cybersecurity education for executives. There is often this discussion that technical staff could not communicate security um, in an accessible form to executives, but it's sort of um, a, a problem on both sides and both parties have to be engaged in the discussions. So we are suggesting that executives should put some effort into educating themselves in cybersecurity not proposing that should, they should become cybersecurity experts, but certainly have a good level of knowledge to be able to uh, make better informed decisions. Third recommendation about appointing cybersecurity ambassadors. So I've mentioned that in 2020, it was, I think, 37% of businesses who had the person responsible for cyber. So there was a good progress from 2019 when it was only 28% but still it's, it's, it's not enough. So uh, an SME is they're particularly struggling there. Typically they have um, IT staff responsible for cyber and it's not the kind of um, direct responsibility. So it comes a part of the um, diverse roles and responsibilities. So for cybersecurity should be owned at SME. There should be someone responsible um, for cybersecurity. So there was a good set of discussions in our research who should be appointed, but ultimately it's up to the each uh, up to each SME and their specifics. But IT staff and senior uh, IT staff would be um, kind of a good um, uh, a good candidate for being appointed and cy as cybersecurity ambassador. Risk based approach. So Joseph was mentioning it in the OT context, but the same applies to SMEs. Unfortunately, SMEs, th there is some guidance, like, for example, cyber essentials, and SMEs can follow those uh, simple steps and, and implement those procedures. But really, they have to be using risk-based uh, approach uh, as well, understanding what actually presents the risk, what should they address first, and balance the resources based on this approach. Unfortunately, there isn't much specific guidance for SMEs and there is a research gap there um, uh, in terms of developing that SME-specific guidance. To support the previous recommendation, understanding full cost of a security breach is important for SMEs. They have a very limited view of what the cost of a breach is or might be, but understanding that in full would really enable them to have that clear vision of the risk that they have from security breaches. So we are citing here a recent DCMS study, and they outline the at least 41 different costs that may be associated with the security breach. So some resources for SMEs to refer to. We have identified the list of important factors that should be considered in the decision-making process. Those um, they were identified and proposed by the SMEs. So I won't read them out, uh, out loud, but they are a part of the guide. So similarly with the metrics, so we were really looking at identifying a set of metrics that could help SMEs uh, to support the decision-making process. 
Unfortunately, we could not identify one metric which will fit all needs and fit all SMEs. So it does not exist. We can confirm that for sure. But uh, every SME, for every case, it, it is possible to identify a good set of metrics which, which will be suitable and beneficial for both business and IT staff. So we are listing some of the metrics which were proposed by SMEs within the study. Recommendation number eight. So it's about cybersecurity driving license, and that idea came very strongly through our study. So similarly to having a driving license before taking your car to the roads, every SME with a digital footprint should have a certificate of good practice or good standard practice in cybersecurity. So obviously, Cyber Essentials was um, one of the schemes mentioned in the study as SMEs, some SMEs, not all, are aware about cyber, cyber centrals, and that may be a good, good starting point. And if SMEs are more committed to cybersecurity, obviously obtaining ISO 27001 certification may be a good option. But uh, security certification is not mandatory at the moment, but we suggest that every SME should really um, consider that as an option. And finally, customer requirements proved to be a very good driver for strengthening cybersecurity. SMEs were prepared to rapidly respond uh, to the requirements of the customers related to cybersecurity. So the proposition is that if individual and corporate customers become more aware about cybersecurity, they insist that good practice um, standards and cybersecurity should be included as a contractual requirement. That could ultimately lead to the improvement of cybersecurity within a supply chain and nationally. So, and finally, so the guide is a, a living document. We will continue collecting feedback and we invite feedback from all individuals and SMEs who are well positioned, who are involved in um, investment decision making process. So all the feedback and comments are welcome. And as I said, the, the guide is available both in Welsh and in English at our website, at, at the RISCS website as well. Thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions later on. That's really great. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to actually now invite up um, all of the panelists um, speakers so far to jump on the call um, because I think we have an opportunity now to open it up for questions uh, from the floor and from anybody. So um, actually I'm going to start at the very end where um, you described Julie in your discussion metrics and I thought that was a really interesting idea. If you're a business, uh, it doesn't matter how big or small you are, um, you want to track how resilient or not you are. So quick question for our panelists. Um, what is a good metric or what might be a, uh, an easy metric which might not, um, in order to measure uh, how did, and determine how resilient a business or an institution is? It doesn't have to cover everything, but what might be one of those metrics that uh, you might, uh, might want to cover? Um, so Dean, I don't know, I'm going to throw it over to you first. Um, you're in the line of fire. What's a good metric? Uh, for me, a great metric is nobody knows. So, you know, you look at, apart from the, the cyber guys sat at the OT sock station, nobody sees the difference. And, and I think if the only uh, alarm we get is a, is a small red indicator in the middle of the OT sock screen, then that's absolutely res resilient. That's what we need. Perfect. Thanks. John, any thoughts? You're on mute, John. <laughs> Sorry, I was uh, hoping someone would do that for, for me and uh, take it up for granted. Um, I think a uh, metric for resiliency would be more rather looking at um, incidents as a general, general downtimes or interruptions to businesses um, or, or operations, um, as in terms of how often they're happening, and then doing sort of a root cause analysis or lesson learned to find out why they're happening um, and you could use that to try and eradicate such incidents in the future. Okay, interesting. And Julia, I know you you had on a whole load of ones up there for your um, for cybersecurity, but for resiliency, what's what might be a good measure for an SME? 
So I guess the general summary is nobody knows. And from our research, we can certainly say that those metrics are not in use or not in active use. But out of those metrics which were proposed, so we certainly have, I think education is important. And looking at the percentage of employees completing awareness training is important. I think that will uh, help with, with resilience as well. Uh, another metric, and I think it's it coincides with what John has mentioned, um, about downtime due to cyber attacks and uh, return to operation time and reducing that return to operation time. So certainly that would help with understanding uh, the, the resilience, the level of resilience that SME or any company would have. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, and on that subject, I think you say we're not really sure we, we might need to sort of measure the time it uh, takes us to recover but obviously we don't generally want to take every businesses down on a regular basis in order to then say aha this is how good i am so josie i don't know if, from your perspective how how would you even train your people to be resilient without yanking the plug on a business on a regular basis yeah so i i think true resilience is not having to respond at all so um, what, what I would like to see uh, kind of coming up is that, you know, control systems are able to just cope with incoming attacks. And, you know, if you look at the Netflix chaos monkeys, they were randomly turning off servers and the Netflix system was able to cope with that uh, disturbance and just keep going. So I, I don't think it's it's very easy to exercise that in any way. Um, and I think, you know, you can only do it with a paper exercise because you just can't simulate it. Yeah. So, John, I don't know about you, if you thinking about that, would you advise the introduction of chaos monkeys into um, an operational system? Uh, no, or is that I don't think... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you'll find anyone that will let you do it. I absolutely agree with the theory of it. I think the alternative is, the, so personally, when I'm doing site assessments um, for clients, uh, I tend to find perhaps the most seasoned engineer in the facility and we'd like to ask him, what A, what would be a really bad day for you if, if the certain asset went down? Um, and even things like, you know, if I were to pull the power cable out of this now, which I won't obviously, but um, what would happen? And if he goes, yeah, or she goes, yeah, absolutely, pull the cable out, the redundant one will kick in and there won't be any impact, then I'd say you're on your way to resiliency. If they look absolutely horrified and tell you don't go anywhere near it, then the system's probably not resilient. Yeah, it's probably very true. And I think, I mean, both yourself, Josie and Julia all talked about the same subject, which is risk assessment. Um, and that goes into it. Oh, well, if we've done a risk assessment, we should be able to cover ourselves off. But I have to ask sort of, um, do you think resiliency is being addressed sufficiently uh, within risk assessments? And if not, why not? So I don't know, Julia, if you want to start with that. Could I chip in on that one? No, I'll I, go ahead. So, so I like to give, so this is years old as an example. And actually it was the biggest financial attack that happened, I think, during the 1980s. Uh, and I, I I have to say, this was really brought home to me. I was I was in a facility over over at a bank over in the US at the time, um, and the and the and the attack was you transferred money country to country, you moved it through, and you essentially laundered it through to where you needed to. I watched some really skilled engineers who knew their business, you know, essentially running around pulling cables out, and they pulled their cables out one after another, trying to trying to stop this transfer, and they knew perfectly well what was happening, and in the event. In the end, they were not quick enough and they were not able to pull it out. And the whole point about that, that banking network was designed to be resilient in the face of transferring money. So when you then needed resilience in the face of a different type of cyber attack, a different type of thing, actually it was, it was the best mm. skills and the best trying to put things on there resulted in a successful biggest money laundering, money transfer attack that there had ever been at that time. And it, and it was, you know, the, the exhaustion as they, as they basically got to a point of I tried to pull all these things out. And it was literally, I pulled out the cable and the resilience that they put in there overwhelmed the people who were trying to react. 
Yeah. So I, I, I think that as we look at bigger and bigger systems and we look at more and more connected systems, we seriously need to think about whether this illusion that we've got about it being able to do all things at once. And the reason why the chaos monkeys and the chaos gorillas work is because Netflix have a particular type of thing they want to be resilient in the face of. It's not that they want to be resilient or that they want to be security, uh, secure. They want to be resilient in the face of a particular type of thing, namely downtime. And I think that's a really important thing to start to look at because we're, we're starting to get these conflicting objectives, starting to see all those sorts of things in our systems. We don't deploy systems to do a specific thing anymore. You know, we repurpose them in flight to do different types of things. And that, that I think, is one of the really biggest considerations when you start looking at what have we got to consider when we're looking at, at resilience and how you do that. No, that's really interesting. So I, d I don't know if you, if you want to pick up on that. Is if a business is designing, you know, even a, uh, any type of business is trying to design their business to be, you know, to be resilient in the face of uh, disruption or attack, um, and then that exact attack occurs and they suddenly want to shut it down and they find, oops, actually, we've designed the system to not allow us to shut it down. You know, would that, I mean, that's an interesting point, but how do you bring that up for a, a business? How do they sort of work out what type of resiliency do they want and what type of resiliency do they not want, essentially? And, so, and yes. don't you think that's yes. the sort of stuff that you're seeing in denial of service? Yeah, the, the fact that people are starting to see these as terrorism attacks is precisely because people are now starting to exploit the very thing that you're you're designing it to do. Sorry, I, I interrupted you there, Julia. That's okay, no worries. So for SMEs, obviously, it's um, much less of an issue for them if they go, um, uh, if they're not available for a certain number of hours a day, become unavailable so they can cope with that. But what we've seen through the interviews, and I try to kind of base my comments um, on, on the results of the study. So it was very clear that uh, after the pandemic, SMEs are more focused on resilience and they're more focused on business continuity. And we certainly had a lot of answers related to the importance of having a business continuity plan in place. And uh, most of the businesses who had that plan in place, they're very were very happy with themselves of having that uh, plan in place and those who didn't have it, so they have it now. So obviously risk assessment is a part of the business continuity plan. So they, based on the risk and, uh, assessment results, they identify those vulnerabilities which they want to be resilient to. So it's kind of connected and the business continuity plan and resilience, they will be a direct outcome of the risk assessment process. No, it's, yeah, I think that's right. And I, um, in trying to identify, um, yes, what do you want to be resilient to? And you're right, in, during COVID, everybody's now trying to adapt and come up to that. And Peter brought it up in his talk of saying, we need to collect evidence uh, of resiliency. So I don't know, Josie or Dean, if you want to sort of chime in, but um, what is the type of evidence that we need to be collecting? If a board member says, you know what, you're right, we need to be resilient. And then you can probably define through feared events what that sort of aspect you want to be resilient against. But how do you collect evidence and what sort of, what's a suitable piece of evidence to, to justify? Yeah, and uh, yeah, I want to pick up on this idea that you can be resilient to one thing, but not to everything. Um, cybersecurity professionals have a tendency to look at OT networks as these fragile glass houses, but they are actually incredibly resilient against component failure, against safety hazards. They're just not component, uh, they're just not resilient against cyber. And so to me, kind of uh, what you need to start doing to prove that you're resilient against cyber is that pen testing aspect. That's the only way you're going to prove definitively that you are resilient. Um, so I, but there's obviously a lot of fear in OT about pen testing because they think it's going to break everything. So you, you've got that chicken and egg scenario where you need to start taking the risk and, uh, and pen testing. Otherwise, you've got no evidence that you are resilient. Dean, is there anything you want to pick up on that? 
I think certainly nobody was, wants to test. So I think it, testing on a, on a system that is live is probably going to be unachievable. I think the best we can do is is run through the scenario uh, and and actually try and predict the the outcome. Uh, looking at the wider picture, I think you know the whole design process for for engineering of automation systems, engineering for OT, we're not quite there yet. But you know, combining the risk assessment, and I agree with John's point earlier with regards to you know, the risk assessment engineering practices are, are there to really protect the systems. A good engineering you know, is required there. But at the same time, we need to consider the cyber element as well. And we haven't yet combined the two into the early stage design of, of new processes, new equipment. We're getting there, but not quite yet. Yeah. So, I mean, on that subject, I think um, there's an element in resiliency is going to what Josie was saying and yourself, Dean, of um, being comfortable with change and comfortable with failure. And you're right, we've had decades of experience in OT and, in, you know, and even in business with being comfortable with certain types of failure in, you know, SMEs. Um, it could be the, the fact that our employees may decide at one point to take another job elsewhere. They may win the lottery. They may no, not come into work tomorrow. Yet the business still has to operate. So we are resilient in some types of failure, but it's that new element of cyber where we're not as comfortable, familiar with those type of things going wrong, with those types of changes and failure. And so I don't know, Peter, what you think, but maybe by in slowly introducing failure uh, from a cyber perspective more and more, people start to become more familiar with things going wrong and will build things to be adaptable to the point where Josie's right. We can start putting in different elements to test that resiliency and make sure that we're not going to fall over in the face of change. I, I think it's more than that, though, isn't it, Alex? Because what you, if, if you look at many of the systems we're now looking at, um, they, they, they're complex systems. They've got emergent properties around them. So And and we know from our computer science, we know from the way that the digital systems work, that single bit errors you know, cause massive changes in systems. You know, it's not like it used to be when you had analog systems in relation to those things. Uh, and increasingly in our OT systems, for instance, we're losing the backup systems that were based on analog. And effectively, you've got, you've got, you know, you've got two digital systems. So what you're, what you're increasingly looking at is a situation where where you're looking at emergence and emergent properties of complex systems. And to me, that is actually that is actually the biggest vector of cyber attack that I'm looking at nowadays. All I have to do is tickle an emergent property. And it's kind of an infinite space. <laughs> yeah, so, um, it, I mean, it's good to hear people talking about things like the penetration testing, but it's kind of, that, that's, that's a fraction without anything on the bottom. <laughs> I, I found 50 out of, out of what? <laughs> Yeah, and, and there's a tendency for us to still cling on to a lot of the of the of the analog um, you know, modes and things that we had there. And actually that isn't the way it is anymore. Even in a lot of these systems that we're relying in, you know, I've seen this in the nuclear industry as much, where actually accidentally we've replaced what used to be a what used to be a diverse system with one that's actually got two digital systems. And they're actually, when you come down to it, both reliant on the same mechanism. The same thing. Yeah, and uh, and it's you know you see minor switches, minor bit bit level things that go in relation to this, and that was what I was trying to say. If Ford changed their car, it's it's correct. They just make a slightly different risk decision. It can break. You know, Mercedes, <laughs> and it's not because they've done anything wrong. It's because what you've got is an infinitely variable and infinitely changing complex system. So. With, on that sort of happy note, I see we're drawing to a close. So I'll leave sort of one quick question for, um, to each of you. Um, and that is, okay, based on the fact that we have emergent properties coming out, it's all getting more and more complex. Um, what is one piece of advice or one thing that you recommend that uh, businesses today could do in order to um, start down that resiliency path to make themselves a little bit more resilient? So Julia, I'll start with you and I'll work around. What's one thing that a business today could do to uh, become a little bit more resilient? What's one piece of advice? It's 
Sorry, Julia, I'll start with you. Yeah. Uh, so I my, my main advice is follow best practices. So there is a good number of standards which summarize based best practices. I think that's the best thing that organizations can do. Cool, thanks. Josie? Um, yeah, make sure you have the right team around you. You know, don't just leave it to the cyber professionals, get the OT professionals in as well. And yeah, make sure that you're well represented. Well, Dean? Uh, bridge this disconnect. Bridge the disconnect between IT and, and OT. I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> John? I would say just start having the discussion and uh, and don't be afraid because you might be afraid to touch your own networks, but there's threats out there that won't be. So it's either you risk bringing them down, trying to make them better, or someone will bring them down for you um, and not care. Thanks. And Peter? Don't lie to yourself. <laughs> okay. So teams, get the right teams, uh, follow the right standards and approaches, uh, touch all the things, says John, um, and we'll be good to go. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I hope you really enjoyed this. Um, and now we'll hand back um, and have the, a great rest of whale, uh, the rest of Wales Tech Week. <laughs>